But thank you for all that um, Gary has um, thought and uh, prepared and um, has uh, prepared to share with us today. Lord, we pray that you would use his words um, to speak to each one of us um, as he preaches now. Thank mm -hmm. you. Amen. Thank you. You may like to turn to Psalm 1 if you have a Bible with you or on the pew seat. And we'll start with Psalm 1 and then we'll move on to uh, the passage or make reference to the passage in Galatians. Um, I think the psalm is about choices and consequences. I don't suppose you've done this. I hardly ever have. But uh, sometimes I've wondered whether I'm growing in wisdom. Uh, you know the verse in James where it says, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God for it. So I think the question is really about godly wisdom, not the common sense wisdom that you might find from culture. I wonder if you've ever wondered whether... Uh, the choices you're making as a disciple is actually helping you to grow into being more wise. And I think we probably all know that one of the definitions of wisdom is about making choices in the present that have good consequences down the track. It's not hard making choices, um, but they're not all wise. So anyway, I've been wondering about that. Um, I've also been wondering as a fellow Christian and a leader in the church, why in the Western world and in New Zealand and in so many of the churches in um, the Waikato uh, that we're actually declining, that our numbers are getting fewer, there's less families and children like younger generations uh, in many places. And when I've talked with people about this, there's more wondering and questions than there are answers. Um, and, well, even yesterday someone said there's no magic bullet to this issue. Although the person I was talking to yesterday is part of an Anglican church in Nelson, and they're growing. So that was an interesting conversation. But I'm wondering about that. And I think it's partly to do with choices and consequences. The choices that we've sort of made. And so in this psalm, I think the choices, the choices part is more verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the one who doesn't do certain things, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. That's, that's in the, mainly in the area of choices, and when it comes to consequences, it's more in verses 3 to 6. So there's a positive one, um, about wonderful trees that are fruitful and sustaining in their fruit and so on. That's in verse 3. And then in verse 4, uh, how the opposite, the wicked, are just like chaff that's blown away and life is wasted and empty and fruitless. And now, the blessing or the curses, if you like, um, finally come from choices. They are consequences. And then in the psalm, you got a reference to the ultimate consequence which is when we appear before God in judgment and how the wicked won't stand uh, in that place. Um, well, in, in the two verses, comments, there's two comments about the wicked and two comments about the righteous. That's the ultimate thing. So choices and consequences, that one is what I think the psalm is about. Now, I think the first key verse is the first one. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. And I think we can see that this is not just about um, a description of character, someone who's wicked or who mocks or whatever, but it's actually about deeds as well. It's about how they live. I did wonder why um, the word has mockers in there. Uh, what are they mocking? Well, I guess in the context, they're mocking God's standards. And they're just laughing at God's understanding of right and wrong. And if they're not, um, and, you know, his ethics, and if they're not sort of outwardly mocking, then at the very least, these sorts of people are indifferent couldn't care less about standards of right and wrong. 
or ignoring them completely and freeing themselves to make any choice they would like at all. So these people are described um, and many commentators, and you've probably heard this before, many of you anyway, that there's a progression in this verse. That it starts, starts off by those who walk in step with the wicked, then they stand in the way of sinners, then they sit in the company of mockers. So it's like there's a progression that they, they, uh, they come into an environment uh, where wickedness stands, where there's mocking and sin and so on. And after a while, uh, they become settled into that. And it begins to become part of their lifestyle. And then it's well and truly entrenched. And, um, and so wrong has, and sin has this ability to compound its effect in our lives. It becomes a habit. And we become comfortable with it. And we say, that's fine. No problem. Uh, and so it's simple things like if you have if you if you deceive someone and you tell a lie, it's not it's not that rare for you have to tell another one to cover your tracks. And so it builds. I remember talking to um, a young woman, and this was to do with um, sexual sin. And she said to me how uh, in the initial phase she resisted and she resisted and she resisted, and then. For some reasons which she, she went in, she gave in. And she said to me, it became a lot easier the second time. She builds. That's one of the consequences. And it's strengthened by others. Um, this verse is in the plural. Sinners and mockers. We need to remind ourselves, no matter how old we are, that peer pressure... The, the influence of the groups that we're in, this is a reality for us, whatever age we are. We are always under the pressure of peers. And so when there's multiple people in our networks who are encouraging us to go in certain ways, then it's, it becomes harder and harder to resist. And so one of the summaries I came up from this was from Jeremiah. My people have committed two sins. It's in the plural. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and they've dug their own cisterns that are broken and cannot hold water. That's in Jeremiah chapter 2. So choices are made, and as we keep on making choices, they have us going in the wise direction or the foolish direction, the direction that honours the Lord, or the one that honours Satan. And they become not just individual sins, but sins of the group. Now I want to spend a bit of time talking about these sins. I, I don't want to be super negative about it, um, but there are risks here for us. And I've still got this wondering in my mind about godly wisdom and where the church is at today. So I've got three headings about what these sins are. Well, the first, I guess, is what you would quickly come to, the sins of commission. Uh, and uh, Galatians chapter 5, the reading that we had, um, uh, has one of the lists that are in the New Testament to do with sins. And there's several of them. Jesus had one as well. You can look them up. And so Paul here in Galatians talks about acts of the flesh, which is meaning the human nature, the unredeemed person. And it's quite a list. Sexual immorality, impurity, some of them are very general. Um, debauchery, that's a lovely word, isn't it? Idolatry, I don't mean that debauchery is lovely. Just a word. Idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and everything else like that. And I've just chosen one to make a brief reference to. Idolatry. Idolatry in our culture. The idolatry that's in our culture that we are part of, that wraps itself around us every day, why do we not talk more about idolatry? 
Is it just because we've got these images in our mind of statues and things? Well, it's not limited to that in the scripture. So, New Zealand culture, what are its great idols? What are the great idols where in which in which they replace God with these things of creation? Well, we can talk about this. The pursuit of wealth is definitely one. Now, we all need wealth of some description, but the pursuit of it and the prioritizing of that is an idol. Um, the whole area of sexuality is massive in this culture with many different facets. And it seems to me the idol of sex, which has been a theme of idolatry through the ages, is very true of our New Zealand culture today. And then uh, the idol of self, of the individual. Now you can explore these things. The point I want to make about the idols of, these, of this culture in, in, in we're in is that their influence on us is inescapable. You cannot divorce yourself from culture. And it'll be a factor in our Christian journey. And so there's a risk, there's always a risk for Christians. That will be no different really in terms of other people in the world when it comes to our values and how we live. So sins of commission are uh, maybe some of the ones that are covered uh, in uh, verse 1, our key verse. Then there's sins of omission. What we should have practiced and lived out and we didn't. Sins of omission. James 4, 17. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And when we talk about sins in the life of the church, when we have prayers of confession, we're mainly thinking about the sins we've committed. But what about the omissions? And so Galatians, many of us will have learnt this. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. And this is where meditation helps. These are general sorts of words. But to meditate into them, to dig deeper into them and to apply them to your lives, then that can reveal maybe habits where gentleness is more conspicuous by its absence. Or self-control likewise in particular areas of our lives. Or it may be something that you just end up um, thinking... Um, I should have spoken, but I remain silent. And so the fruit of the Spirit that I could have expressed didn't get expressed. So when I think about the sins of omission, I think, I'm thinking mainly in a way about how far the church may be from being the radical alternative for life in this society where we live in New Zealand. Because when I read the Gospels and I listen to the words of Jesus and I read some church history, not just in the scripture, but afterwards I think, my goodness, have we lost the plot somewhat about what it means to be a radical, kingdom-orientated group of God's people. Well, there we are. Sins of commission and sins of omission. And I've got one more and you can add whatever you like as well, sins of complacency. Sins of complacency, uh, if you want to know what that sort of word means, uh, it's about being just satisfied with the status quo, comfortable with the status quo, satisfied with oneself, unawareness of dangers and deficiencies, just complacent, content with the routines, Assuming that everything's okay, life has its ups and downs, but it's fine. That raises a possibility of just being complacent. And in the church, 
there can be something as simple as I just like what happens here. It suits me. And I wanted to continue like this. And I hope no one rocks the boat. I don't think it's a conspiracy. It's just an unintentional acceptance of the status quo and you become complacent. And as other people have said, if you don't make a choice, well, that's a choice. And there's consequences. So, um, we're here on Sunday morning. What's happened here is not very different at all from what's been happening for years. Now, that might be a good okay, but it may not be. And at least we should ask questions about why do we gather, what do we mean by worship, and so on. I noted, and we haven't lost them, I noted that when I was here last and it was leading up to uh, Pentecost, and we brought our prayers to Jesus, we've kept hold of those. One of the themes of those prayers was a heart desire that here at Oaks we may grow. And that was expressed in different ways, picking up different facets. Well, if those prayers are to be answered in our journey with Jesus, then God forbid that we should become complacent about anything. So, um, three reflections about sins of a commission, omission, and complacency. We need to move on and finish off. So, what is the way forward? It's back to choices, isn't it? The choices that we make. And it's a very clear theme of Scripture. It, you, you, you will, as you start thinking about this, you, you'll think of all sorts of examples. So, I've just chosen uh, three. Um, first of all, from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 30 where Moses is addressing all God's people as they are on the verge of entering the promised land and, and going forward. And he says, um, I have sent before you today life and death, blessings and cursings. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God and listen to his voice and hold fast to him. And it's almost as though Moses is standing before the, the people and saying, Oh, for God's sake, choose God! Because he's acknowledging it's very easy to go the other way. And if you know anything about the history of God's people moving into the promised land, the culture of those promised lands, that promised uh, land's peoples kept on drawing them away. So choose life. And in Jesus, he talked uh, lots of examples, but he chose to be out walking in the narrow way and not the broad way. And Paul in the Galatians reading uh, talks about you can choose to uh, live according to the works of the flesh or you can choose to live by the Spirit. Now we desire to know more of the Spirit's life in our midst. Well, let's choose that that might be so. And so the second key verse is verse 2. Um, it, it compares the wicked, those who walk with the wicked, saying, Rather, blessed are those whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. Now here's the choice for us. To choose to delight in God's word. Um, you know, what we know of the Bible and, and how that links with the living word, which is a spirit speaking in our, to our lives. It's the law of the Lord. To be delighted in it. To be committed to it. To be enthusiastic about it. To be curious. To grapple with its difficulties. How enthusiastic are we in grappling with God's word? Of reading it and meditating on it. How passionate are we? Use some strong words. 
because there's choices and all of that. Meditating on it day and night, it's a priority. It gets our constant attention. It's a, we're accountable to it. It's marvellous. Now, I've been reading this book for ages. Well, years. There's always more to discover. It's amazing. But it comes back to the choices we make about um, how we handle it, whether we're reading it, studying it, meditating on it um, daily or whatever. And we need to seek God's word together. To, to choose together as God's people here in Oaks to um, submit to God's word and to meditate on it and to grapple with it and to seek his guidance through it. And out of that, positive consequences. And um, I'm, I'm glad Linda mentioned it, um, the, the metaphor, to be like a tree that's planted by streams of water. And, and you know water is a very strong theme in the scripture about God's blessing. Be like a tree planted by streams of water that's fruitful in season. And the leaf does not wither. Whatever these trees do, it's sort of mixing things with it, but whatever these trees do, they prosper. So let's have this uh, vision, this drive, this desire to see oaks be fruitful and to prosper and to grow and to be healthy. Do you reckon we can do that? Yes. Because, amen, because we're God's people here. He loves us. He values us. And he wants us to have a strong you know, vision for the community and so on. The thing is, the world is changing and how we express the good news, how we um, uh, express being the church of Jesus Christ, there needs to be adjustments and change in that as well because we're no longer in the same, concept, uh, the same uh, culture as a decade or so ago. And so that's our task together, to discern the future that God has in mind for Oaks. And the council, the Oaks Council has a role in that, but we actually all have a role in that because we're in this together. So we enter into discussing and praying and so on as we journey into God's goodness. All my life, all our lives, He has been faithful. So, so good to us. And as we journey into the future, may we see that more and more. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, when it comes to all the choices that we make as individual followers of you and as followers together of you, help us to make choices that bring consequences in the life of your kingdom and into our own personal lives that are fruitful and positive and of great benefit to you. Bring us to that place, Lord Jesus, when it can be said that we are blessed because we delight in your word. We meditate, grapple with your word. Help us to be serious about sin. Help us to be serious about living in your spirit, being led by your spirit, inspired by your spirit. That we may bring honour to your name. Amen. Thank you.